Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. Good evening and welcome to Prime Time Local News. We begin tonight with news from the Alberta RCMP Major Crimes Unit. Yesterday morning, the Lloydminster RCMP responded to information of a deceased male inside a home on 47A Avenue in Lloydminster. Elaine Bem of Lloydminster was charged with second-degree murder in relation to the death of Darren Bem. Bem is set to appear in provincial court tomorrow. Police are not seeking any other suspects and no further information will be released. Saskatchewan is reporting three new cases of COVID-19 in the province, bringing the provincial total to 1,604. 60 cases are considered active. One more person has died in the southwest zone and was in the 50 to 59 age range. Three people are in hospital, two of them in intensive care. 1,520 people have recovered. The Conservative Party has their new leader in Aaron O'Toole, and he has his plan for the Conservative Party going forward. Connor Chan has reaction to Aaron O'Toole's win with Battleford's Lloydminster MP, Rosemary Falk. Joining us today is Rosemary Falk, the MP for Battleford's Lloydminster. Now, Rosemary, I know you were at the eve of that long, long election for the new Conservative leader, so just kind of take us through the evening and how that all played out. For sure. So it was very... Uh exaggerated <laughs> uh, just because there was some malfunctions with the with the counting machine um, that being said I, I believe the program was supposed to start at 6 p.m. and I don't I don't think we got results to even I want to say after midnight Eastern Standard Time I could just be exaggerating that all in my mind because it was just so long um, but it was just it was a long process um, but I feel like that kind of um, is expected just with the type of race we had, right? This race was supposed to be finished end of June, um, but due to COVID-19 did get exaggerated um, until now. So I, I think, you know, not only myself, but even the membership um, of Battleford's Lloydminster, and I would say even just in general with the Conservative Party of Canada, we're happy that this is over. And now that we can uh, move forward uh, to making sure that we can uh, hold Justin well, I guess continue holding Justin Trudeau to account. I know on your Twitter you advocated for Leslin Lewis, but the majority, of course, went to Aaron O'Toole. What are some of your thoughts on his plan and his platform going forward? For sure, yeah, I did. Uh, I did endorse Leslin Lewis, um, as did a few of uh, other sitting MPs and colleagues of mine did as well. Um, you know, I just need to note that she did take Saskatchewan. Um, you know, every she she won the province. Uh, she was a hundred points short of winning Alberta as well. So I think she resonates uh, a lot with uh, Western Canadians and Western um, Western Conservative members. Um, you know, that being said, of course, uh, Leslin. Lynn has come out uh, behind our new leader, um, as as we all should, right? This leadership um, contests are like this. They, you know, we uh, people get behind a candidate. Um, we want to uh, get our candidate out there as much as possible, share their ideas, um, and then when that race is over, we get behind our new leader. And you know, I'm just gonna you know mention a couple of the things that um, Aaron O'Toole has said that he's going to do. Like he said in his speech that night on Sunday um, or Monday morning, <laughs> however we want to define it. Uh, that, you know, he's been given a clear mission, and that's to unite our party, to champion our conservative principles, um, and to to continue to show Canadians um, that Justin Trudeau and his liberals are failing our great nation. Now, like you mentioned, Aaron O'Toole says he wants to unite Canadians as well as be a social conservative party. How does that and other issues that he's addressed play out in the conservative party going forward? Yeah, I, you know, I think this is the moment where um, all of us conservatives um, who are members and non-members get behind our leader. Um, and I mean, and we continue to hold Justin Trudeau accountable. I mean, when we look at even um, Justin Trudeau proroguing parliament, uh, one of my committees or one of the committees that um, were cancelled quote unquote, because um, Justin Trudeau prorogued parliament was one that I was sitting on, um, uh, which is human resources and social development and uh, status with persons with disabilities. And we were, um, this is kind of a catch-all committee where we get everything. 
And um, we were studying the effects of, of the COVID-19 response that this Liberal government has and, and how it's affecting seniors and how it's affecting children and families um, and workers, because all of that falls in this committee. So, you know, Aaron O'Toole is going to continue uh, to hold Justin Trudeau accountable for his actions and his inactions um, that he has had. And I think when we look at the WE scandal and the controversy that ha was emerging uh, and the documents that were needed to be provided to committees that were doing investigations like the Finance Committee or the Ethics Committee and to have him prorogue Parliament and cancel all that um, is just uh, cowardly, <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, I, I expect that our Conservative caucus under the leader, um, Aaron O'Toole, will continue to press the government for answers on these things. You know, one of the things he's also mentioned to Rosemary was the he's putting the interest of Canadians first. And how does something like that play out into us here in the battle for his Lloydminster area? Absolutely. It's 100% important, right? And uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, back in 2017, when I won the Conservative nomination, uh, you know, uh, the members, the membership of Battleford's Lloydminster trusted me to take that message. And I can guarantee and tell you that I will continue to be the strong advocating voice, not only in the House of Commons, but also in our caucus room for the, for the, the people of Battleford's Lloydminster. Um, I have not been silent on... Uh, um, you know, uh, how this Trudeau government has affected families, how it's, how it's affecting farmers, how it's affecting our energy workers. And I will continue to stand up and um, make their, their issues known and continue advocating for them. So I can guarantee you that I will continue to do that, even though we've had a leader change. Well, Rosemary, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining me today. Yes, anytime, Connor. You have a wonderful rest of your day. A new shuttle service is being offered around Lloydminster to help residents get to their medical appointments and more. The service is aimed to help individuals who are unable to drive to the amenities they need that may not be located in the border city. The service is mostly uh, picking up customers from Lloydminster and area and either taking them to Edmonton or Saskatoon, be it for shopping, trip to the casino. Um, healthcare appointments, which I'd like to specialize in. The shuttle bus can seat 20 individuals. It also has wheelchair access for those who may require it. Bozer mentions that the idea for the service came to him after learning how hard it was for seniors who can't drive. Well, my wife works at a senior care home and she mentioned that it exorbitant costs just to get some of the seniors up to the city for medical use and you know, I just kind of drove by and saw a shuttle for sale the one time and me and my partner talked about it and it just kind of snowballed from there. So hopefully we can uh, serve these seniors and, and everyone else the best that we can. Bozer said since Lloydminster doesn't have a real transit system, he wanted to fill that gap by starting this shuttle service. Ever since Greyhound uh, closed business around here, there's been a lot of struggle just to get from the the city's even just a one drop-off point. So this works out really good because I drop off to all appointments, major malls and casinos. So I'll get you all the places and pick you back up. So I think this could be a really great service for a lot of people around here, especially in the times we're living in now. Currently, Bozer is only offering limited services as the real opening date is September 14th. The shuttle services will be available throughout the week as well as limousine services on the weekend. There's the truck here that's also for use in case we can't fill the bus. There's also an eight-person limo, uh, all with slightly different rates. More information on the prices and other details are available on their website. Now our Connor Chan will take a look at your weather forecast. All right, thanks very much, Jazz. Taking a look at temperatures right now, 21 degrees right now. We're sitting at right now. Cloud coverage is coming into our way right here as we could see some showers tomorrow as well. Uh, right now, it's sitting at 21 degrees, as I mentioned. We did see a little bit of rain earlier in the daytime, but nothing too, too crazy. Just a little bit of, of spitting rain. But as we take a look for areas, rest, around, other temperatures, excuse me, around the area, 16 degrees in Vermilion, 21 in Lloydminster, Vagerville, Edmonton, St. Paul, Bonneville, and Cold Lake also sitting at 20 degrees with Lac La Biche. Provo sitting at 23 right now. A little bit uh, warmer out in 
Macklin at 24 with North Battleford sitting at 23 degrees. 21 also for Meadow Lake and we see 19 degrees in St. Wahlberg as well. So here's a look at what we could see in the satellite radar map this is come from a few hours ago coming into the little bit there as we see that area of precipitation and some cloud coverage coming into that Lloyd Minster Mar Wayne area in the coming hours or so. So that rain we could see we could see a little bit of showers overnight tonight, but there is a 60% chance we could see some thunderstorms for tomorrow as well. So take a look overnight North Battleford 8 degrees with some cloud coverage leading into showers tomorrow with that high of 19 degrees. Cold Lake sitting at 9 degrees overnight with a little bit of clear skies there, but still sitting with some uh, showers expected for tomorrow with that high of 19. And then for us here in Lloyd Minster, some cloud coverage overnight and translate into some rain, possibly some thunder showers uh, on uh, for tomorrow, excuse me, at that daytime high of 19 degrees. So here's a look at what we could see for the next three days. We should warm up a little bit more on Friday as we have that high of 21 degrees and then 17 degrees on Saturday as we get a little bit more cloud cover is rolling in. Uh, we will start to see a little bit cooler temperatures starting on that Sunday, Monday in the morning. As I did mention yesterday that it is going to get cooler in that morning area and morning fronts as, uh, excuse me, as we are going to as we are rolling into fall. But that is a first look at your weather forecast. We'll have more primetime local news coming up after this. Welcome back. Returning to school can be stressful under normal circumstances. Now even more so because of COVID. Eric Bay has more with a local psychologist on how to deal with back to school stress. I'm joined today by Michelle Hamilton, a psychologist here in Lloyd Minster. Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time here today. Now school is obviously a very stressful time in itself. And now this year with COVID, it's kind of ramped up. Just first off though, how natural is it to be stressed and should parents and students be a little concerned about, about their stress levels here heading back to school? Well, I think, you know, the back to school time of the year is often, you know, a bit of a stressful and anxiety provoking time for, for many families, you know, the parents feeling pressure to get the kids prepared and for children, the experience of new, you know, new people in new settings. Um, on top of that, of course, this year we have COVID. Um, and the uncertainty of many of the potential scenarios. Um, but I, th I think one important point that I want to make, up, make uh, at the outset is imagine how far we've come in the last five months when I did an interview with you back in March and all of the uncertainty that we faced then with this pandemic that suddenly created such sudden and unexpected change in our lives when we had to shut down schools and offices and so on. Um, we've come so far and we know so much more now. And so one thing I think is really important is to um, focus more on what we do know. And we know a lot more and have hopefully been accepting the fact that some of the things we can do to keep ourselves safe, such as wearing masks and sanitizing very carefully and maintaining our social distances, these are important continuing pre um, preventative measures that we're all going to have to accept and uh, do our best to uh, adapt to. So modeling for the children um, and all of us uh, the idea of coming to accept the reality that the pandemic hasn't gone away, but we've got to work with what we know and continue to go forward um, back to what might be a little bit more of a normal life. Now, is that something maybe you suggest for both parents and children, if either of them are feeling stressed, just to kind of control the controllables, as you say, and, and accept what our, what our future is going to hold and what it's going to look like here for the near future? Yeah, absolutely. I think like in all situations of transition and stress and change, there's so many things we can't control and that we are not um, sure. You know, uncertainty is very uh, anxiety provoking for many people. But in those times, it's especially important to focus on what you can control. And so again, that really specifically means focusing on your, your own behaviors and of course, your, your own attitudes and, and sort of willingness to accept um, and, and to, to be flexible and adaptive, as opposed to the rigid, reactive, or kind of angry stance that you know, some, some people might be taking in light of some of the restrictions or, or COVID precautions. 
And now, uh, is there anything else that maybe parents can do? Obviously, kids are going to be going back into some fairly uncertain times. Is there anything parents can do to help their children, whether their children are feeling anxiety, to help them kind of de-stress? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, um, as I've kind of said already, I think it's important for parents to try their best to model both acceptance and precautions and also um, calm, you know, and so to just like imagine the adapting uh, over the years of all the different things we've come to take as such normal ways of operating, like putting kids in car seats and wearing seatbelts and so many other things that wasn't always the normal behavior, but we learned and became very normal practice. So to, uh, to practice mask wearing, to get some experience with, you know, uh, getting used to wearing it and uh, accepting the fact that, you know, these continued precautions could continue on for a long time. Um, I think that, you know, the more we focus on the excitement, the positives of going back to school for the children, to really try to redirect the talk and the children's focus to what they're looking forward to, what's going to be fun, what, you know, what have you missed, what are you most um, excited to kind of return to. So it's really important for parents to try to really direct their children to focus more on, on what is hopeful and what we have control over. Now, one last thing before I let you go, obviously parents are going to be concerned about their children, but how concerned should they be about their children going back to school into these new realities? You know, both, both children and adults really can be very resilient and adaptive. Uh, and so we want to, you know, expect that the kids will adapt and probably a lot more easily than, uh, than the adults in some ways. So, you know what, I feel really excited and hopeful for the teachers and for the students uh, getting ready to get back to school and different than most years. But on the other hand, some, some things are the same as always. All right, Michelle, really appreciate getting to chat with you once again. Thank you so much for doing this interview today. Now here are your stock market prices for today. Today's oil prices are brought to you by First General Services. This past weekend, the Saskatchewan Premier Baseball League wrapped up their shortened season. Our Evan Kenny has more on how the seven-week season finished. Thanks, guys. This past weekend, the Northwest Prairie Pirates AAA 18U team played their final game of 2020. Unfortunately for the team, it was an 11-1 loss to the Saskatoon Diamondbacks, but just because it was a rough final game doesn't mean the entire season was rough. The regular season saw the Pirates finish in fourth place with a record of 8-11. Even in the shortened season, this is three wins better than 2019, where the Pirates went 5 and 25. This regular season, the Pirates scored 131 runs while giving up 137. Earlier in the year, head coach Dan Keck had this to say. Our offense is going to give us a chance to win every game. I think that's what we've proved. So our pitchers got to throw strikes, and uh, we, we got some of the best pitching in the league when, when they're on. So. I'd say that's our, our biggest downfall right now, um, but yeah, the, the amount of confidence they're playing with, and like you said, the momentum is huge, so I, I don't see any, any negative in the future, to be honest. One player on the Pirates walked away with individual hardware this year. Brendan Hamilton won the top batter award for the North, having a batting average of .476 and an on-base percentage of .542, while also adding nine runs and nine RBIs. The ultimate award was handed to the Sask 5 Giants. The Giants went 12-7 in the regular season before going undefeated in playoffs. Their final win was 2-0 over the Regina Athletics. Kyle Froelich from the Munster Red Sox was the only player to win two individual awards, walking away with the top North pitcher and the North MVP. Evan Kenny, Primetime Local Sports. 
Now we're Connor Chan. We'll take a look at your weather forecast. All right, thanks very much, Jasmine. Taking a look at temperatures right now, still sitting at that set. We're sitting now at 17 degrees right now, so we're getting a little bit cooler as, of course, we see some clouds starting to roll in. And possibility we could see some thunderstorms later tonight as well. There is that chance of a thunderstorm. We'll take a look at some areas uh, out west there. 22 in Rocky Mountain House and Red Deer in Edmonton. 19 degrees for Edson and Jasper with 20 degrees out in Athabasca and 18 right now out in White Court. Over in the Saskatchewan areas right now, a little bit warmer, sitting at 25 in Saskatoon with North Balfour sitting at 23 and Prince Albert also sitting at 24 degrees over in the northern areas right now of Alberta and Saskatchewan, the Lash and Buffalo and Arrows both sitting at 22 degrees, 18 degrees. We see there in LaRange, South End and Walston Lake. Uranium City still sitting fairly cooler, sitting at 13 and then 20 degrees out in Flin Flon right now over in Alberta right now. Uh, Slave Lake sitting at 18 degrees with Fort McMurray and Peace River both sitting at 17 degrees. High level in Grand Prairie both sitting at 20 degrees right now. Now as we look over in the southern Alberta areas right now, 26 in Lethbridge with 27 degrees. Fort Medicine Hat, 24 in Calgary with Banff sitting at 22 degrees. Coronation also sitting at 21. Over in the southern Saskatchewan areas, they're still fairly warm compared to what we saw yesterday with the 30 degree mark. But Moose Jaw sits at 25 right now with Swift Current at 26 degrees, 23 for Kindersley and in Yorkton, and then 24 degrees in Regina. So here's what we could, here's what we see across the country right now. We see a lot of uh, areas with some cloud coverage, just like us here in the Midwest region. So 24 out, as I mentioned, Regina, some cloud coverage there. And then 24 also out in Winnipeg. Quebec City sitting at 15 degrees right now. Toronto sitting at 20 with St. John's and Halifax sitting at 16 and 17 degrees right now over and up north in the Northwest Territories. Yellowknife with some showers at 14 degrees and then Whitehorse sitting right now at 15 degrees. Vancouver with some sun sitting at 19 degrees. Edmonton with some uh, cloud coverage and of course we did see on the side of the radar map they could have some rain coming their way with that high of 22 degrees. So here's what we could see for tomorrow. We could see, we do have a 60% chance we could see some rain, some of that rain continuing on if we do get that risk of a thunderstorm uh, later tonight. So 19 degrees in Vermilion, 19 in Lloydminster and Rainwright and Vegreville as well. 21 for Edmonton tomorrow. Uh, also, we'll see 19s up in those northern areas right there in Bonneville, Cold Lake and Lac La Biche as well. Macklin sitting at 21 tomorrow, uh, 19 degrees in North Balford as well with 18 in Maidstone and then 21 in Meadow Lake and Isle La Crosse as well. Well, uh, St. Walbert also sitting at 19 degrees. So here's what we could see over the next seven days. 21 on Friday, 17 on Saturday. We'll see a lot of cloud coverage there on Sunday. That high 12 degrees and fairly cooler morning on Monday there at that low of 5 degrees we could see there and then 15 degrees there for that daytime high on Monday. 19 on Tuesday and then 17 degrees on Wednesday with mostly sun and a bit of cloud coverage. Our averages of course are starting to drop a little bit, especially in the daytime low area where we've gone from double digits into single digits right now as we do see a lot of eights and seeing it fairly consistent with what we could see for our average low for the next couple of days. That is a look at your seven day forecast. We'll have more primetime local news coming up. I'm joined today on primetime local news with Heather Milky. She's from the Lloydminster Primary Care Network. We're talking about the Excel program. It's in a program for people who have recovered from cancer or are in the process of recovering from cancer. It uses exercise to help um, with some side effects and it's available for people here in Lloydminster and uh, other rural areas. It's done virtually. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me today, Heather. Thank you. So our topic of discussion is uh, this Excel program, which uh, stands for uh, Exercise for Cancer to Enhance Living Well. Uh, can you just talk to me a little bit uh, about the program? Yep, for sure. So it's an exercise program specifically for those that have been diagnosed with cancer, possibly they're going through treatment or anywhere up to three years post-treatment. And it's providing this exercise program virtually to people that are living in rural areas like Lloydminster. And uh, what, are, like, pe what are you hoping that people will be able to get out of this program? Well, I think they will get quite a lot out of the program. We know from other exercise programs that going through an exercise program or any other kind of group with other people that have a similar background or situation to you and the support that you can receive from that is really valuable. And then, of course, physically with exercise, um, we know that a lot of people with cancer, one of their main side effects is fatigue. They lose strength and stamina and exercise can address all of that. 
And you mentioned that the program is virtually, it's done through Zoom. How long is the program? The program will run twice a week for a, uh, for a period of 12 weeks. And uh, anyone that takes part will have an initial assessment done virtually again with a clinical exercise specialist or exercise physiologist from the University of Calgary, just to ensure that they're a good candidate and so that we can track some outcomes comparing before and after. And has there been a program like this before for uh, people with uh, recovering from cancer, um, you know, using exercise? Absolutely, there has been, but it's been run in person and really only offered in the bigger centers. So in Alberta, uh, that would be Edmonton and Calgary. And so the whole idea with the Excel project is to offer it to people that maybe wouldn't otherwise be able to participate because of where they live. And do you think that's a really important part of this is being able to get like show people, give it to rural people um, that might not have access to other programs? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really valuable. We know the benefits of cancer or of exercise for people in any part of the, the cancer journey and uh, where you're where you live shouldn't be a barrier to accessing the best cancer care. And uh, who is able to sign up for this program? Yeah, like I said, anybody that's over the age of 18 that's had that cancer diagnosis and it could be new, they could be in treatment or like I said before, anywhere is up to three years post treatment. And for people who are interested in uh, learning more or even signing up, what are some steps they should take? Yeah, well, they can directly contact the University of Calgary. I can give you uh, the email address. It's wellnesslab at ucalgary.ca or more locally, if it's easier for people to get a hold of me at the Primary Care Network, my number there is 780-874-0490. All right. Well, thanks for taking some time uh, to talk to me today. I know that this uh, is something that I feel is very beneficial for people. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, people in the Lloydminster or surrounding areas are able to uh, get in and uh, find some uh, use out of this program. Yes, I totally agree. And we're really looking for participants right now. We're hoping for a September 14th start date. So um, thanks for helping us get the word out. Perfect. Is there anything else you want to add before we go? Nope. I think that's good. Awesome. Thanks so much. Furniture set and design supplied by Furniture Gallery and Furniture House, downtown Lloydminster. I'm speaking with Nevin Demiliano with Prairie Storm Chasers. How are you today? I'm great. How are you, Shelby? I'm very good. So with August coming to an end, could residents expect more storms to come in the future? Yeah, I think uh, for Canada, our severe storm season always kind of stretches from end of May through September. So we can still get severe weather for sure. I think uh, some threats will start to decline at the end of August here. So the tornado threats will probably go down, but uh, the threat of hail and uh, severe winds still very possible. And compared to the previous years, how would you rate the storm season so far for this year? Uh, it kind of depends on where you were. So if you were in Calgary, it seemed like you never ha stopped having storms. And in, in some areas of the prairies, you never stopped having rain. So it really depends on where you were. Uh, last year, I feel like I was chasing a lot more up by Lloyd. And this year, I wasn't by Lloydminster at all. So uh, that's kind of how it goes with weather. Um, but the season isn't over yet. What can we expect for fall coming up? Do you think it'll be like calm weather or might expect some worse weather? Yeah, it's always hard to tell uh, for when we're storm chasing, we can only kind of tell exactly where storms are gonna be about two days in advance. So uh, if the systems line up and the weather's right, you can still get severe weather um, anywhere on the prairies, but that could be one person on one side of Lloydminster and someone uh, just on the other side that gets it. So it's very variable, so it's hard to tell. And in your opinion, do you think tornadoes could be a big possibility still for residents to expect? I'd like to never say never, but uh, definitely, as we've seen trends over the past number of years, uh, the number of tornadoes definitely go down in August. So uh, it's definitely not as big of a threat, but it's still there. Now, I actually wanted to bring up the Manitoba tornado that killed two people. Can you kind of give some insight on how destructive that storm really was? Yeah, uh, a couple days before we were even keeping an eye on that forecast and, and one of our team members of the Prairie Storm Chasers, uh, Sean Schofer, lives kind of in that area. So he was chasing that day, uh, but it's not the kind of day that we wait, wanted it to pan out that way. We didn't think it was gonna pan out that way. Um, it started uh, the day and we knew that there was a severe threat, but we didn't really expect tornadoes. So the fact that there was one very devastating tornado 
um, just goes to show how imperfect the science of, of kind of predicting these storms really is. Uh, I think there's a lot of credit to the meteorologists who warned that storm and also the storm chasers who were reporting on it because that storm um, kind of initiated and did all its damage and even took two lives and then even uh, kind of disappeared about an hour later. It was amazing how that works. So that whole storm was kind of gone. So you always got to be aware. And I think uh, Sean highlighted that in some of his chases and his reports. So we hope that those got out to the right people. But unfortunately, weather, you can't control everything. Yeah. And can you kind of give us a general understanding of what storm chasing is all about? Like, what would you say you do on a daily basis for your job? Yeah. So I think the most important thing for our team is uh, being able to target these storms. So looking at weather models, pouring over data like that and uh, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, obviously, uh, when we're out seeing these storms, we're kind of the only ones with live eyes on them. And we know that that's very important to the officials who are warning the people in the path of these storms. So we relay all that information to Environment Canada or local meteorologists through social media and through phone calls to make sure that those people are, are warned in advance and can take shelter. Mm -hmm. And in your experience so far with bringing up, being with Prairie Storm Chasers, uh, what is probably the worst storm or worst uh, tornado kind of you've ever experienced and chased? Hmm. That's, uh, I think it's different for all of us on the team because we've all kind of chased different tornadoes. Uh, but the one thing that's consistent is, is no storm is alike. Uh, sometimes tornado is not the scariest threat that's out there. It's, it's either uh, extreme wind can be just as damaging uh, or uh, even lightning. We can't predict where a lightning bolt's going to strike. And if we're close to a storm, that can be a, the biggest threat for us. So some of these storms in the States in Tornado Alley are obviously on another level. I think that that would be what everyone says on our team. Um, for me, some of the scariest storms I've been haven't produced tornadoes. So just being in the core of some of these severe storms on the prairies can be very damaging to vehicles and uh, property. And is there anything else you'd like to add for residents to know about, especially during storm season? Yeah, I think uh, anytime you're working outside or camping, I think it's important to know uh, what you should do if, if you do come ac across a big storm like this or a severe thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning. And uh, I think really having a way of getting those warnings is, is the number one thing. Don't just rely on your cell phone, have other ways of getting them, whether that's ra uh, radio or like weather radio. And uh, also just know what to do. So camping to me, you're so exposed and, and just knowing that you shouldn't stay in your trailer or if you're driving on the highway and the storm's coming, maybe you shouldn't uh, keep driving into it or things like that. Like uh, if you're stuck in a situation where the tornado is actually gonna hit you, like it's better to be in a ditch or a low lying area away from trees and not in your vehicle. So things like that, I think are really important. And if you're camping, a tent is not a great place if you're surrounded by trees and there's a big storm about to come and push all those trees down, right? So finding a uh, shelter and knowing what to do in those situations, very important on the prairies. Well, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Nevin, and giving us some insight on the storm season so far. Thank you. All right, taking one last look here at your weather forecast. We could see some showers uh, heading into tonight. Chris, we did see that a little bit in the evening here today as well. So we could carry that into tomorrow as well with that 19 degrees. 21 on Friday, 17 again on Saturday, 12 degrees on Sunday, 15 for Monday, the 19 on Tuesday, and then 17 degrees we could see on Wednesday. Thanks for joining us on Primetime Local News. Have a great night.